Республики, Центрального банка Республики Армения, Айк Витисян представит очень интересный доклад. Не в этой аудитории объяснять, какую роль неопределенность может играть для денежно-кредитной политики и какая высокая многоплановость может быть у этих вопросов. Поэтому доклад, безусловно, интересный и интригующий. И также представляю, естественно, дискуссанта Алексея Заботкина. Думаю, что сегодня стоя сессии будет крайне интересной. Доклад и дискуссии будут на английском языке, но так как Айк хорошо говорит по-русски, то он согласился великодушно принимать вопросы на русском языке. Те из вас, кто взял гарнитуры, чтобы использоваться переводом, обращаю внимание, русский язык на втором канале. Давайте начнем. Айк, пожалуйста, у вас 20 минут. Спасибо большое. Спасибо большое. Спасибо поблагодарить Банк России за приглашение и за предоставленную возможность поделиться с нашими идеями по этой теме. И с вашего позволения я перейду на английский. Uh, okay, so <coughs> today I, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about the, about the type of work that we are doing in the union, why not, with regard to the new, new kind of framework, which So it's rather than looking at different ways how to deal with uncertainty in terms of the in terms of the modeling, in terms of the communication, and in terms of the um, uh, understanding the impacts of uncertainty on the economy on the economy and the macroeconomic environment, we just try to concentrate all this discussion into a one framework, which we call as a risk management approach to the market. Of course, uh, the idea is not a new one. It has a framework. It's a systemic view uh, to the issue. It's a, new, uh, it's a new one, and we are trying to uh, to, uh, to uh, publish it from scratch to the Central Bank of Germany. So the first thing that we want to, uh, what is the motivation for this? The motivation are, are the three things that already became uh, became a new a new normal kind of the description of the new normal the first thing is that big shocks hitting the economy have become more, more frequent this is like living in this very recent uh, history <laughs> and the life with covid starting with covid then not after that we have multiple other shocks like globally originally and inside the country we are all the time facing with the big shocks hitting the economy and more importantly this shock became bigger, more and more frequent So the second thing, of course, the uncertainty has always been part of our job at the central banks, part of our uh, problems in a sense, but uh, what, it, what is currently becoming a new normal, the uncertainty, the increase of the uncertainty. In every situation, we are, uh, we are struggling, uh, struggling very much at the central banks in the economic analysis world just to identify a few things. First of all, where is the economy now? So it's very important to understand and there is big uncertainty there. The second thing is what are the driver forces? And this is again another, another big place for the uncertainty for us, for, for as macro analysts to understand. And so, and what will be uh, happening in the future? So all these things are very important uh, parts of our job at the central bank in order to design and um, properly uh, design the monetary policy and later on properly made monetary policy decisions. So, and this, uh, and this becoming a new, uh, new reality that we are facing heightened uncertainty along all, the, all these slides. And uh, we're facing this uncertainty very often, the central banks are really very good doing policy, but at the same time very bad in basically communicating those policies. For example, if, uh, if we uh, think about uh, how do we communicate about and, and guide the fin financial markets in a sense with regard to our interest rates, and here is a graph uh, for, for uh, many countries, for a few countries basically, Czech Republic, Sweden, Norway, Uh, and New Zealand, and uh, and and we, if we look how they uh, were communicating the uh, the future about the interest rate, we can see that it very often doesn't coincide with what actually happened with their interest rate uh, decisions. Of course, it's not a thing that the people are not uh, are basically trying to confuse the market. No, not really, because 
workers, we know that we more like to help rather than to confuse the markets. But what, uh, the, this is the reality. This is the thing that actually happened. Why? Because most probably we missed one very important part there, that uh, when we are facing with the big, big uncertainty in, the, in terms of the understanding all these three factors that I mentioned, then most probably we also just choosing out of all possibilities in the world, just uh, uh, choosing uh, all possible, out of all possible scenarios, just uh, choosing just very uh, simple one and basically communicating with this one. But in real life, the monetary policy work uh, makers actually might be also doing very really great job, basically uh, trying to uh, optimize or the manage all the risk or, or uh, trying to get very good strategies there in uh, to design their monetary policies but very often this doesn't coincide with the pre-communicated uh, ways of understanding about the economy that's the that's the issue that the issue why it is this is the issue because this is an issue uh, related to the very important variable component in our monetary policy making this is the credibility so if we are confusing the market in a sense with regard to that we basically choosing a very simple scenario and, uh, and communicating that one but at the same time we know that at the central banks we are doing our all, our best basically to find out the true strategy out of uncertainty then there is a kind of a, a this uh, disconnection between these two things really making decision on, ba on, on on fundamental better grounds, but at the same time communicating in a wrong way, in a sense. So, and this is the problem, uh, this is creating problem for the credibility. So that's, that's why uh, we basically uh, uh, motivated ourselves just to try to think about a designing a framework, which, um, which just addresses the issue of uncertainty directly in the policy making uh, framework. And also, uh, because of that, uh, we also want to uh, focus, uh, refocus our attention more to the, uh, to the risks that, uh, that would happen to the, to the monetary policy world, rather than trying to optimize the, uh, and find the more optimal policy path and communicate that with the public. Uh, this gives, of course, more flexibility for the policymaker, but at the same time communicates and also design, uh, and also targets the exact way of policy making that the central banks are doing. It's not the thing that we are just suggesting new ways of doing a policy making, but this is a new ways of thinking about a policy and also communicating it properly to the public. Uh, that's why we want to address that part. And I would like to mention the key part is, here is all about institutional setup and communication. Uh, so, and of course, uh, and of course, I've talked about big shocks, frequent shocks, uncertainties. Of course, we have also to think a little bit, we were talking with Sergey, <laughs> think, think, uh, think a little bit also about how do you have to uh, rethink your modeling framework. And of course, there is not much changes there to happen, but just to realize that when you are facing with big shocks, you have to be aware about the non-linearities in the, in, the, in, the, in the behaviors of people. So you have to be careful with that because in times of the big shocks, very often you will end up appearing in this uh, kind of uh, frontiers of the behavioral changes when the, the normal behaviors that you try to um, describe in linear uh, models or in linear uh, ways of um, uh, modeling, uh, you might, very often you might uh, uh, miss, miss the key, uh, key point there. So of course the idea is not new. It's coming, uh, going back. It's it's not 2004, but 1994, <laughs> 1994 uh, uh, from um, Alan Greenspan. So the idea is not new in terms of the strategies that the monetary policy are uh, that the monetary policy makers are choosing. And you can find many cases, probably also the case of Bank of Russia, Central Bank of Armenia, many other countries that it's from time to time they have just resort to this kind of strategy, basically, which is risk uh, risk uh, uh, risk management approach to monetary policy, which is just try to understand the sources of risk, uncertainties with regard to uh, those risks, uh, with regard to the uh, macroeconomic environment, trying to quantify those risks and basically uh, uh, and to identify the costs associated with risk and 
make a decision. So this is the way how you uh, could frame the risk management approach. And if you look at the countries, it, it, it's, it's also the case in many countries we also properly communicated those things. For example, I was looking at uh, Sweden National Bank, uh, New Zealand National Bank, a certain episode they were clearly also communicating about their decision which was resorted to exactly this approach um, uh, of uh, trying to uh, manage the risk. Uh, and also the fact uh, like in many occasions uh, we could also take this kind of uh, messaging there but what we are trying to do we are trying basically to incorporate this into a more formal framework very important um, uh, okay um, uh, very important uh, component that uh, usually in the discussion of this framework uh, arises from questions that we are getting is the the risk that the people think this will uh, push the central bank towards more discretion rather than away from some kind of rules because when you have a kind of some kind of strict baseline you very often resort at the end of the day to this baseline if you are not having any baselines anymore then most probably uh, you are kind of untying the hands of the central banks and the central banks can do whatever they want. But it's not really the case because till the key components of the policy making, uh, uh, of the policy making I would be there. I will just, uh, those are the key things that the kind of normal frameworks usually should have. Uh, as I mentioned, like where is the economy now? You should, central banks should also, should clearly understand uh, and also communicate this part. What are the driving forces for the economy? This is another important thing, but what is more important uh, is the third one. This component is very often absent in many central banks communications, probably also in, in uh, uh, from time to time, also in the decision-making. Uh, this third one, what the central bank should do to achieve the objectives under its circumstances. The circumstances, And that's exactly the case when uh, I'm just referring to the Bank of England uh, monetary policy reports, so how they are communicating the monetary policy. This is the way how you should not do monetary policy and communicate the monetary policy. This is when uh, you project some kind of inf inflation going back to the target with a constant interest rate. This, this cannot happen. This is the thing that we all have to understand and also to communicate properly to the markets. Without central bank clear understanding of how they should react in certain situations to bring back it and also to communicate how they are going to bring back inflation towards the target, it is not going to happen. So that's why this third component is very important uh, for our discussions, uh, for, for the central bank. And, and yeah, and so why were uh, kind of... Um, going away from the baseline and also from this uh, problems in the with the local approximation of course we're modelers you most of you are here like researchers better researchers for sure than me but yeah but the very important part is here like it's about the, when you are driving in a very and in the, the and there is very big uncertainty and if they are turnovers in their in the uh, in the kind of in your way so there is a, a non-linearity in your life then you you better to be careful right because if you just linearize and drive you can you might end up in the in the in the in the forest uh, so especially in times when there is a fog on the road and you have to kind of control your uh, speed basically and control uh, your view in order to not to get into the forest but rather to identify the turnovers and properly target it so this is uh, another very important uh, very important aspect uh, that i have already mentioned so all this kind of was motivating us basically to go to introducing this new framework and of course Many of you could have an access to our papers, and also the, uh, we we have uh, we have officially started to talk about this back uh, in October last year, when our governor actually was uh, in the governor's talk at the IMF was introducing this new idea uh, to the public, and then we have a kind of uh, deadline or a plan strategy to launch it officially January next year. So all this time we are working on just on different elements because. Uh, this is first in the world that the central bank is trying to conceptualize this issue into uh, these uh, uh, ideas into a framework and we are basically starting from scratch rethinking thinking uh, experimenting with many elements and uh, trying to do this so now uh, now basically to the to the core so i have spent 
almost 15 minutes just to describe the motivation right <laughs> but now to the to the to the but but that's that's very simple so what we are su suggesting we are suggesting to get away from the baselines why because very often uh, we okay if you are policy maker or if you are macro analyst very often you are making judgments about certain episodes about certain issues to construct a scenario we are always doing that, making judgments in every case. So in this making a judgment, you are, we are basically taking lots of responsibility on us with regard to policy. Because if you take another position, most probably the policy decision or the policy recommendation, whatever you can call it, would be something different. So why we are doing that? There is no sense to do that. So that's the idea. Then, then we have come to the idea how then to go further, right? And the idea is, okay, looking further, whenever you, we are making a judgment, we have to think what kind of risk, what, what is the size of the risk, or what kind of, what is the cost or what the burden of the responsibility that we are taking in making this judgment. If this is small, okay, you can go, go, go with this. If this is big, then you have to like clearly communicate this to the, to the board who are making the decisions or and to the public who are taking all those decisions. So this is the idea. Then you identify risks with regard to any kind of judgment that we are making with regard to, uh, with regard to the current situation and uh, designing the scenarios accordingly, communicating, making decisions accordingly and communicating to the public accordingly. That's why usually we can, uh, okay, what, what, what are the key risks for the central banks? either inflationary or deflationary, this binary choice, right? That means that all the judgments that we are making, they could, uh, they could uh, either risk you on the inflationary side, right? basically missing the inflationary kind of story or missing the deflationary kind of story. That's why in all, making, in all these uh, uh, decisions with regard, to ju uh, with regard to assumptions, judgment, we just can, cons uh, can uh, consolidate or group all these risks or assumptions into these two cases and uh, basically come up with two possible risk scenarios. Those are just typical scenarios. Those are not any clear elaborations of the world. Those are not some probabilistic scenarios. Those are the risks that describe the, po uh, those are the scenarios that describe the possible risks for the central bank to miss. So this is the thing that we have to control. Those are not too, this is different from, and I, I want to spend this uh, last minutes to, uh, to discussing, this is not really the same as having baseline and alternative. This is, those are not alternative scenarios. Alternative means that we are describing the world with some alternative possibilities. So those are the scenarios that describe what are the key relevant risks for the central bank not to miss in making decision. We, so this is shifting, in, in a sense, shifting some kind of a mindset there, rather than uh, basically, because in, in the previous framework that we all the central banks and the Bank of Russia is uh, also uh, refer, uh, like uh, using this FPAS Mark One framework, we were all doing this, right? We are having baselines and probably most probably also some uh, alternatives, describing the alternate, possible alternatives about, about the about the world but those those is uh, those are not possible alternatives about the world those are the possible uh, uh possible scenarios that describes that basically they describe the fears or the scares that the board members could have and the and the monetary policy analysts could have with regard to monetary policy so we we have to be careful with it. and and finally uh, and finally some things with regard to how to construct the scenarios. Of course, all the scenarios should have the same clear uh, three, uh, three components in those. And this is the same as in all the FPAS frameworks in the, future, uh, in the previous framework as well. But what, is, what, what we should be careful with regard to designing the scenarios, those should be having these three characteristics. Those should be realistic, of course. You cannot uh, kind of create some scenario which is uh, 100%, of course, all the scenarios are 0% through. They are 100% uh, wrong, but, but they should be realistic so that you can communicate that. Those, they, those should be relevant for the policy. Of course, you can come up with uh, 
kind of for trillions of different assumptions in the about the world but those or uh, will not have very good relevance for the monetary policy okay you you better don't concentrate or your effort or resources on, the, on designing those scenarios because they have less relevance and of course um, a very important part those scenarios have to be related to the data which means that we should not think about kind of inventing shocks inventing shocks may, meaning okay we all are aware that there is let's see uh, 0 0.1 or 50 percent probability that that asteroid would hit the world right <laughs> the, the earth so uh, this is a shock that we are could create and come up with a scenario what would happen if the asteroid would hit uh, the the the, uh, the earth and what would happen and so on this is not the thing that we want to have there in the scenarios because it's it's irrelevant to go to the board and discuss uh, uh, discuss these kind of scenarios but it's better just to concentrate on what is the current what is happening in the economy now what it should uh, should give us uh, uh, to think uh, with regard uh, to the current uh, situation and of course i will skip the uh, modeling uh, some uh, some uh, uh, very uh, detailed part with regard the modeling and concentrate on how the basically the decision is made this is a scrap from our uh, probably last or previous uh, monetary um, uh, the, the minutes from our monetary policy decision and here is clearly how the decision was made when you have to dis when the board was basically were discussing the case a type scenarios case b possibilities and at the same time making decision discussing about what are the risks that is more relevant for the central bank in our in in this particular case the risk is okay the inflation is going down we are below the target but we are still concerned about how the uh, we are still concerned that some components, very important components of the monetary policy relevant components are still above the target and we have to be careful. Why? Because we don't want to me enter, uh, appear in a situation where we are at the end of the day, uh, kind of the inflation will revert back to the, to the some higher levels and we end up in, uh, in a more inflationary story. Why we are more concerned about that? This is exactly the essence of the risk management story. And just very quick remark with regard, uh, for example, the historically how it would work. Uh, for example, uh, during the COVID period, right? COVID period, this was the case when we were all more concerned whether this is a supply or a demand shock, right? Depending on whether it is supply shock or demand shock, it will have clearly different implications for the monetary policy making. So uh, what we can do, we all did, we assume that it could be a demand shock. And then we took this strategy. For example, how the Fed, ident uh, Fed uh, resort to this story to describe this as a demand shock, because they were more feared, fearful about the deflationary kind of risk, because they were just getting out of the deflationary side of the story. They just wanted to uh, kind of um, ensure themselves against back against coming back again to the deflationary type uh, deflationary kind of environment that was the decision why they res uh, decided to call it more as a demand shock rather than as a supply shock in our case let's say in central bank of armenia okay we were more concerned of missing the inflationary kind part of the story because we are in emerging countries what is the most important risk for us? Okay, it's clearly not deflation, right? <laughs> it is clearly inflation. So that's the risk management strategy. What we did, we are more concerned about the inflationary part of the scenario. That is, we are more fearful of missing a story that is more inflationary than the story which is more deflationary. All the times we are doing that, what we are suggesting to communicate both, because we did both, but we communicated only one. Probably the Fed did only one and communicated only one, but this is very important to, to, to do both and communicate both to the public. So, and yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I, I will stop here and later on with the questions, probably I can cl clarify more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll start this presentation, please. Thank you very much, please. Да, спасибо большое. Я не обещаю, что я смогу мейкап за время. У меня было обещано 10 минут. Наверное, я его немножко переберу. Если можно, отмотайте на презентации несколько слайдов назад. А, у меня кликер, да?
Uh, uh, so it was agreed that this session will be in English, so I will speak in English. The uh, thing uh, which I would like to point in the in I slides uh, before moving to uh, my uh, uh, my discussion is uh, uh, this particular picture uh, because it visualizes the uh, items to which I will be referring in uh, in the discussion. So uh, to sum up, uh, the case A and case B is the range of the outcomes which if I understood it correctly, is within the realm of reasonably probable possibilities, right? This is feasible boundaries of what might happen from the current initial conditions with the reasonable assumptions about the future, uh, future shocks. So there is nothing unexpected kind of, it may, you can think about it maybe something which falls in sigma or one and a half sigma around uh, kind of the central, the central line. And uh, then case X is uh, something which is significantly outside the, uh, uh, the baseline and it in a way kind of shows uh, something which uh, shall be regarded as the tail risk. And kind of I will now elaborate a bit more about how uh, uh, the approach explained by Ike is uh, actually not that far from what Bank of Russia is practically doing uh, uh, these days uh, uh, in our uh, regular work on the monetary policy. Uh, could you bring, please bring up my slides? So, and uh, uh, in the interest of time, I will uh, skip the usual uh, uh, sort of ritual of summing up the presentation and the paper um, of the uh, of the speaker, and uh, we'll delve uh, right into three uh, topics which I would like to focus on first of all and the main part of the discussion will be about uh, the uh, bank of russia current uh, fps practice i think it will be of interest to everyone present here uh, the second topic uh, which uh, is uh, i is of significance to the any transition you make to a more elaborate FPAS framework is uh, not uh, what matters is not only how your internal decision making process modifies, but also how your communication with the outside world reflects this modified um, internal decision making. And then as the concluding uh, remarks, I will say a couple of words about this overall uh, line of thinking about the uh, policy making as a risk management exercise to demonstrate that it's actually it's not confined to the monetary policy, although the monetary policy is a, an excellent example on which it is, uh, you can illustrate this, uh, uh, this angle of approach. So if we uh, just uh, now uh, make a step back and uh, quickly go over how the Bank of Russia is arriving or to its baseline forecast or carving it out, it would be a more um, adequate uh, uh, semantics here. Uh, uh, in the pack of the uh, supporting materials for the monetary policy meeting, there is a large deck of the model projections. Uh, a certain part of this deck is prepared by the monetary policy department, uh, headed by Kirill Tremasov. Another part of that deck uh, comes from research department headed by Alexander uh, Morozov. And uh, there are also the views uh, which come from our uh, regional uh, offices. Uh, there are seven of them around the country. Uh, one of them is here in St. Petersburg. And in, on its premises, we uh, conduct today's event. Uh, the departments uh, within their decks present their opinion about what the baseline projection the baseline model projection for Russia is alongside with several alternative trajectories. I deliberately not calling these scenarios so that not to mix up with scenarios because scenarios is something which is outside of the reality. The alternative trajectories can be driven by uh, rather modest differences in the assessment of the initial conditions or the pace of the fade of the shocks which already have happened. They typically do not assume significant new shocks or some changes to the assumptions about the steady state of the key variables, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the original headquarters present uh, the baseline projections for their macro regions. So for the 
parts of the country which uh, they uh, uh, look after. And uh, this, uh, uh, the aggregation of these uh, forecasts, obviously it's not internally mo model consistent, right? Because it comes from, the, from different uh, forecasting teams, uh, but it is a useful reality check if there is a, uh, for the top down, forecast produced or proposed by the by the departments. If there is a significant wedge, it's a reason to go and try to reconcile where, what drives that wedge. And uh, maybe some views of the departments could be adjusted. Maybe uh, the regions are missing some spillovers from other part of the country on their stories. And then, and here is the key point, right? The published Bank of Russia baseline forecast, the one which appears in the press release and then goes into the monetary policy, uh, monetary policy report, uh, it is uh, formed as the collegial opinion of the board on the central tendency, which is informed by this very broad range of trajectories, right? And uh, uh, then there is a final step, which is made by the department, once the discussion is over, it usually takes a couple of days, Monday, uh, Monday and Tuesday, uh, the uh, uh, department uh, assures that the resulting forecast is model consistent with the core model of um, uh, which is used by, this, uh, by the central bank. Um, and uh, uh, this kind of two-stage process uh, drives a compromise between this kind of collegial view and uh, the view of the department. The key point here is that historically, uh, since the start of the inflation targeting uh, 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 framework, Bank of Russia always communicated its forecast, not as a point forecast with the definitive trajectories, but as a range forecast for all key variables, be it GDP, components of GDP, the key rate uh, projections, the monetary aggregates, exactly to reflect that indeed, there is a degree of uncertainty of how the situation will be evolving, but kind of if kind of it evolves within this channel, kind of the monetary policy will be bringing this channel at the end of the day for inflation to 4% towards the end of the projection period. And uh, with this respect in the frame of the FPAS uh, Mark II, uh, explained by Ike, the ranges which are published in our uh, forecast table is de facto the range between case A and case B, even though kind of we never specify the edges of this uh, of these ranges as standalone self-sufficient scenarios, right? Uh, and then the most interesting part is of course about case X, right? This kind of outside. Uh, alternative. And it, uh, as I said, it, uh, if I understand it correctly, it illustrates the most fat tailed risk of the day. Kind of what kind of uh, doesn't let uh, the central bank to sleep quietly. All right. Uh, and uh, in the sense it uh, depicts the skew uh, in the balance of risks relative to that kind of channel, which is determined by case A and case B. A range and alternative scenarios which are presented by departments always include at least one and frequently more than one uh, case X type studies. Again, it may be driven either by assuming some large new shocks or different assumptions about steady state of uh, key uh, drivers of the model, be it a neutral rate or be it a uh, level of the budget deficit in the terminal point. Uh, the, uh, it may also be an exercise in evaluating the uh, model uncertainty, the uh, uncertainty which is introduced by the fact that maybe the policy transmission will work differently. And last year, that was an important part of the exercise because there was an understanding that the uh, parameters of the trans transmission could have been changed by the events of the last year. And uh, uh, then the board communicates uh, the balance of risks in aggregate arising from the, again, collegial judgment about uh, how um, uh, these um, alternative scenarios add up uh, uh, probability-wise. Uh, qualitatively, it is summed in the paragraph, 
rather several paragraphs at the end of the press release, which actually describes the net direction of the skew of risks to the inflation forecast relative to the baseline ranges and the principal sources of risks which drive this skew. Uh, quantitatively, the Bank of Russia is communicating selected case X type scenarios in its annual monetary policy guidelines. And there they serve a very specific purpose to illustrate, we're not saying that the world necessarily, or there is a significant probability that the world may evolve along uh, these uh, rather unusual uh, trajectories, but rather we say that if such thing happens, then the monetary policy will act in this manner, and that will bring inflation down to our target 4%. So in a way, it is an educational and illustrative exercise to demonstrate that the uh, whatever happens, the central bank will do whatever it takes to bring inflation to its target, right? Um, and uh, moving on to the uh, second part, uh, again, uh, it's uh, even though internally we have this uh, rather kind of multi-stage and very multifaceted approach to thinking about the uh, underlying uncertainty about the uh, future. Uh, the uh, explaining it to the uh, uh, public is a hard exercise, right? And uh, the most famous quote probably about the communication of the central bank goes to uh, Wim Duesenberg, who was the first uh, a president of the uh, ECB from 98 through 2003. Uh, it usually is quoted not exactly to the word, not verbatim. Usually it is cited something like uh, the central bank's external communication should uh, be reflective of uh, details of its internal decision making process. And of the exact language is somewhat different. But what is important for us uh, for um, uh, today's discussion is the sentence which follows this quote, uh, adopting too simple a form of presentation would not honestly convey the complexity of the analysis we have to conduct. And indeed, if the central bank is not explaining uh, clearly enough uh, what went into the decision, there will be the wedge in the, between uh, the central bank's understanding of what it is doing and the public's understanding of what it is doing. And that may create uh, unnecessary uh, tension uh, between um, the monetary authority and uh, the uh, rest of the economic agents. Uh, the uh, problem with explaining everything in detail is um, uh, yeah, lies in several dimensions. First, the general public actually expects certainty from the central bank, right? And uh, they are not usually satisfied with the sense that the only certainty which the monetary policy will provide is that the inflation will be consistently converging to the target. And uh, the value of that certainty is very high, but the general public is not sufficiently impressed by that. And uh, with that respect, putting too much emphasis on the uncertainty may actually work against uh, the uh, efficiency of the uh, communication and transmission. In our case, uh, it is it has been a very fine line to walk uh, uh, in the early stages of the inflation uh, targeting. Uh, uh, not uh, on the one hand to communicate clearly the balance of risk. On the other hand, uh, not to over communicate uh, pro-inflationary risks so that not to create additional impetus for the uh, rise of the inflation expectations when we were fighting to bring them down. Now, uh, that is of lesser concern now, but it's still something which is in the back of our minds. Uh, and then the second thing uh, is that when you have too many scenarios or trajectories, uh, then it may excessively shift attention of uh, uh, our audience uh, towards outliers. And uh, unfortunately, the media may be uh, quite prone to focus more on the uh, outlier cases because they actually generate more catchy headlines. Uh, and uh, But these kind of outlier cases are less important for the understanding of what we are doing here and now, right? Uh, and then the third thing is the differentiation between sources of uncertainty. As I said, 
those uh, different trajectories and those different scenarios considered by the board, uh, uh, they uh, differ in the nature of what drives those differences. And strictly speaking, not all of them are comparable uh, pairwise because kind of it's one thing if you generate a different trajectory with uh, some extra shocks, it's a completely different thing if your uncertainty, the source of your uncertainty is the change in the assumption about the, uh, the steady state or the internal structure of the model. And with that respect, kind of the discussant is supposed to give some suggestions for uh, further thinking on the topic. I would like to pose uh, three questions uh, for uh, which may be of use kind of as you transition towards F plus two in uh, January next year, uh, which communication device is more efficient for conveying the nature of uncertainty to markets and uh, public presentation of multiple explicit model based trajectories and model consistent trajectories or the range based central tendency along the lines of how kind of we're doing it in the Bank of Russia. The second question is uh, how frequently the central bank shall quantitatively communicate to the public case X. Again, for us, the frequency is once a year. And the tight question to that is how the central bank handles the switch from qualitatively, qualitative switch from case X based on one nature, uh, one fat tailed risk to another source of the fat tailed risk. Whether they switch means that the new uh, risk is now significantly more uh, important and the, la the previously uh, emphasized risk is almost redundant or it's just kind of the difference is more on the margin, right? And uh, it, it will require additional explanations if you decide to actually on a quarterly basis kind of explain to people another case X, right? And uh, to conclude, uh, the regulation as risk managers, I would dare to say that uh, economic regulation at large is, uh, that may be a, an overly strong statement, but is very much about risk management indeed. And uh, uh, the reason uh, behind that is that uh, the regulation compensates for uh, the tendency of economic agents to have uh, not infinite uh, planning horizons. Uh, the, uh, their tendency to have an optimistic bias, that's optimism is, an, um, is very typical for human nature on average at least, and it is even more typical for entrepreneurs and capitalists. Otherwise they wouldn't have been taking the risks to advance the society forward, right? And uh, three, uh, the, uh, uh, of course the individual economic agents cannot fully take into account uh, the externalities and systemic risks which are generated by their individual decisions. These decisions may be optimal for them, but they may be disastrous for the society as a whole. Uh, and uh, for that reason, any regulator necessarily, in my view, exhibits a higher attention to risk than an average or median economic agent. And uh, this tends to be frequently misperceived as an unduly elevated level of risk aversion, but in reality, it is a more somber and uh, longer term evaluation of the abject reality, right? And uh, I would uh, even state that only if, re if regulator is more aware and more concerned about the risks than the average or median economic agent, it will be able to contain these risks because if there is a bias towards greater optimism and lesser consideration of the societal interests on the part of the individuals, there shall be always a counterbalance which works in that direction. Uh, and Unfortunately, explaining this to general public is a hard job, uphill battle, but it's our job and we'll continue doing it. Thank you very much. Большое спасибо, Алексей Борисович. Мы вышли за пределы времени, но лично мне не жалко, потому что действительно было очень приятно послушать. Я думаю, что в любом случае мы не можем лишить себя возможности задать несколько вопросов. Пожалуйста. Пожалуйста, Андрей. Спасибо. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ike. 
Alexey Borisovich. So I have two uh, short questions. First, first question. So there is uh, extensive literature on uh, robust approach to monetary policy, Arfanidis, uh, Williams, uh, Levin. So how uh, does your framework relate to this uh, literature? And uh, the second uh, uh, question is, um, could you comment on my interpretation of your approach? So if uh, board members are diverse on what to do in a given situation, then uncertainty is high. And in this situation, if diversity is high among the mem uh, board members, then uh, it's safely to tighten. Because an emerging market economy faces uh, um, high inflation risks, for example. So could, could, could you comment? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the questions. <clears throat> Probably I also later will have a chance just to, uh, to somewhat comment <laughs> uh, Alexey Boris' uh, 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 issues that he raised. So first of all, with regard to robust monetary policy, whatever you call it, you are researchers, whatever you call it, <laughs> I would agree. Yes, of course it is. It is, of course, because here we are not trying to qualify it with certain words, whether it's robust monetary policy or it is related to that, but in a sense, yes. But at the same time, it should not be kind of, um, it should not be defined in these uh, exact exact words. Why? Because uh, here the, the issue is something different. It's not about like just trying to come up with a monetary policy which is robust to certain situation, other situation, trying to come up some regime switching <laughs> understanding about the situation. No, it's all about just decision making which relies on the risks, on the risks, not on the possibilities about the world. So this is, uh, even in this risk management approach, there could be robust, uh, robust approaches, more kind of, uh, uh, would say, more uh, uh, orthodox approaches and so on, even in the risk management world. But in this current situation, yes, I could, I could uh, describe in that way. Uh, yeah, for the second question, uh, please, sorry. I, so, it yeah. was very interesting. So, uh, could you comment on uh, the, for my interpretation of uh, this framework? So. Uh, if, uh, uh, if the board members' diversity is high, then, uh, which means high uncertainty, then uh, it's better to tighten. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I will go directly to the literature. Usually we had, like as policymakers, we had some kind of uh, rule of thumb with regard to uncertainty, okay? We, we always were thinking, like it, it was coming from, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Brainer's paper, uh, and this paper was, was clearly telling, like there was a rule of thumb, if there is uncertainty, you better to wait. <laughs> now, now, now recently, very recently, and you are like uh, probably taking this, uh, another way of thinking about that. Very recently, there are multiple papers where just recommending the, just the, the other way around, right? If there is uncertainty, you better to, uh, to be very aggressive in, in your decision, whether to tighten or, uh, or, or whether to ease. So this is exactly what we would, uh, would uh, avoid in the risk management approach. Okay, what is, what is then the situation? Okay, if we are in a deflationary situation and we are more concerned about the deflationary uh, shocks or not shock, scenarios, still there is uncertainty. You better to be very aggressive. If you are in a deflationary kind of mindset, you are not 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 my side, but you are you want to avoid from deflationary uh, risks, but you are getting more shocks or more scenarios with regard to inflation. It's better to wait. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly the the situation with the COVID that I described, right? Because in U.S. and emerging countries, okay, or Armenia, U.S. in the same situation, the same shock, the same uncertainty with regard to whether this is demand or supply. Right, but we were more concerned if uh, no, uh, to missing the point that it could be a supply. The Fed was most concerned with missing it if it would uh, would be a kind of a demand shock. Right? That's the weight and and uh, kind of uh, aggressive or tighten or uh, those are strategy. But in, uh, but again, uh, with regard to board decisions, it's a very important point. Um, what what is key, very key element in this framework, this is individual accountability of the board members. Without that, it will be difficult to communicate it properly. 
because without that we cannot tell how there is a divergence in terms of the understanding with regard the risks that we want to control. Yeah, and uh, probably, yeah, uh, okay, I can go with uh, answering to other questions, but probably some small uh, small yeah, comments course, with course. regard or just uh, describing it. I, I, I admit <laughs> it is very difficult to communicate. I cannot it communicate with all, like, more professional, kind of in a more professional auditorium or environment, it would be very difficult to communicate with the general public. And that's exactly the place we, we have all this uh, kind of divergence in terms of the understanding this and interpreting in the other way. So uh, this, is, uh, this is all right. I, I clearly would say, okay, the, the framework that we had, you had in the Bank of Russia, this was kind of the one that I would really want to have in any FPAS Mark I frameworks, uh, including in our case, of course, uh, resource constraints <laughs> will be somewhat different uh, different here in, uh, and in, the, in Armenia. But here, the sh uh, there is, uh, I, I would like to mention that this is not about um, the risks that guide, okay, this is not the scenarios that have certain risks. This is exactly the case in, in FPAS Mark I framework when we have scenarios with risk. And this risk could be higher, lower, and the magnitude could be higher, lower. This is the, uh, this is the thing when we are thinking about the risks with scenarios. We first think about the risks and then try to come up with scenarios for those risks. This is the difference in that uh, mindset. It is very difficult basically just to uh, to to communicate also with the with the with the more um, qualified auditorium, but this is the difference in these uh, two approaches. Uh, uh, so you have to first think what what what. Okay, any board members has certain fears. Okay, certain fears, inflationary or deflationary fears. And okay, if I'm more fearful about the inflationary scenarios, I uh, I would like to have a world you as us as a kind of staff, professional staff, to provide the board members with a world that is, describe, uh, that is describing the, what, what would happen in inflationary kind of risks, what we, would, what we have to do then. And if the, I'm a board member who are more concerned about deflationary kind of risk, I would like to have a scenario when these risks are. This is not about that you can have uh, two different worlds at the same time. This is two different risks, then you come up to creating kind of worlds for yourself, just to describing those risks. And they could be multiple there. Uh, this is uh, the way I would like also to comment with regard the ranges versus the points. Of course, um, uh, you can interpret this way, but this is somewhat different. Somewhat different because it's not, we are not describing with cases and cases about the ranges with regard to the possible, uh, uh, with respect to the possible baseline. It's not really that, those, but it is just, uh, could, gi could give you some scenario out of billions, some scenario that describing the concerns or the fears with regard to the inflationary type of world, and some scenario would describe just a concern with regard to the deflationary type of world. Both could have some kind of, uh, both. Both scenarios could have uh, their own uh, uncertainties, parametric and everything there. So this is somewhat different there, but yeah, it is very difficult to communicate. Communication would be the key challenge for us because yeah, you, we are going out of the business, <laughs> providing a baseline into the markets and the markets have to provide themselves <laughs> to themselves, right? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's probably the thing. Uh, yeah, so um, at least in terms of research, all this seems to be very promising because you guys are kind of stepping into the new territory and uh, a lot of uh, to research now, and it's going to be a lot of a lot more to research afterwards when time, times go. And uh, two questions. The first one is: um, Do you already get some kind of uh, feedback from the broader public of uh, what you are doing? Because I would uh, let's say worry less about the professional forecasters because they tend to gasp the new concept of the central bank pretty fast. Uh, but uh, what about the broad uh, business and the broad public? This is the first question. Uh, I mean, what do, do they really understand what you are doing? And uh, the second one, um, when, the, when the board comes up with some particular decision and this, this is within the 
the uncertainty fan chart, uh, how do you, how are you going to communicate uh, on which scenario are you currently in? Because uh, I mean, when uh, if if the fan chart is when the level of uncertainty is, is uh, let's say normal, the fan chart will be uh, moderate. And uh, the, when, when you're within the fan chart, there are basically not much to communicate because, like we guys already told you everything. But uh, when it's like uh, 2022, the fan chart would be uh, a lot more, and it's not it's not enough to say like we are within the fan chart. We, 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 you should you should probably say uh, which scenario are you currently in. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I will start from the second question because this is uh, this exactly the point that I was making at the end of my last answer, answering to this question. Uh, this is not about the fun chart uh, because because this is a, some a somewhat um, nuance, nuance. There is somewhat nuance there, right? Uh, this is not about the fun chart and you are above or below. You could describe a world like a scenario which uh, if you would say, okay, is there a probability of this? How, how big is the probability of that? I would say zero because the same is with the baseline, right? So in that sense, it should be realistic, but it's, I cannot uh, just uh, assign certain probabilities to those scenarios. We are communicating to the public. Uh, in that sense, it doesn't really matter because you, what you are communicating, you are communicating, this is, I have, zero, uh, I have zero tolerance, whatever the risk would come in the inflationary part or deflationary part. So my actions are to go against and controlling against those risks. This is not that you are, you, you cannot communicate to the public, this is the right kind of, uh, uh, this is the right world that is going to happen. In that sense, this is very important. This is another very important question that we are always asked about. Are, uh, so we are dropping guiding the financial markets, right? Yes. <laughs> we don't want to guide them. We want to be guided by themselves. We want them to create their own understanding about the world and as us as policymakers to understand what they are really thinking and us as a policymaker to guide them with regard our kind of nudging them with regard our uh, concerns. If we are concerned that this world will go towards more inflationary, we can nudge them. This is exactly the risk management. We can nudge them in the market that our board decision is, our board is more concerned about this risk. So guys, that's why we are tightening. It will go, enter into their uh, uh, understanding, yes. If not, okay, we have to think, to think about that. And uh, yeah, with the broad, broader public, uh, it was. It, it is very difficult. We are just starting to our uh, like just starting to designing our strategy how to go to the broader public. We had a few discussions with the more professional levels in July, August. We are planning to uh, to talk already with the financial analysts and later on with the general public. But as part of the general public, IMF, uh, they are concerned. I would say why, because they care about having a baseline. <laughs> but we say okay, you have to design your own. Don't don't rely on ours. You have to design your own. Огромное спасибо. К сожалению, мы совсем уже вышли за время. Александр Георгиевич, ну как не могу не, не дать вам слово как организатор. Тут очень короткие. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, try to be very short. Uh, uh, could you clarify your uh, case X, uh, in a sense, uh, how policymakers treat it as uh, just uh, a possible development, uh, and uh, they have to make sure that they know what to do if things go this way, okay? Or is uh, additional argument for them based on uh, what we have in case X, either disinflationary or proinflationary risk sphere? Uh, that inform them uh, whether they should be more aligned with case A or case B. Which one is true? <laughs> or probably <laughs> third one is true? Uh, yes, we will try to avoid... Uh, so this is one thing, the case X, although we had this in the paper, 
but this is the one thing that we are not yet concentrating more on on just trying to elaborate a little bit because we have to rethink about those although we had this in the paper still as an option because this is exactly the the risk that we want to avoid because if we for example have a case x and, and communicate that as additional factors uh, this is supporting the case A type of world, uh, we want to avoid that. But case X uh, usually comes in the very, very uh, kind of in the crisis situations. In the crisis situation, we still can think about the possible A world and possible B world, inflationary, deflationary, but when we are already in a crisis, it could be deflationary or inflationary, right? In the crisis, that's why case A or case Y, right? Uh, so in that case, uh, you can communicate as an alternative way of exactly what you are, what we are still doing in this F plus Mark One framework. This is about alternative, some kind of an alternative, but very tail kind of alternative, trying to keep it away from the exact discussion about case A, case B. We would like to avoid that confusion. That's why the second one, we would like to avoid that. More, more towards the first one, but this is still going back to this F plus Mark I type when you have some kind of alternative world. That's why it is still, I cannot comment whether how, how should be using case X. I hope we will not be using those, <laughs> but at least we will have this, uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, option there, still uh, option to describe some very corner type of scenarios, dark corner scenarios. When you are already there, you cannot avoid from, uh, from doing like the really the hard job killing everyone or, or not killing everyone then you have to probably go to the public and talk about this. But we will keep this kind of in a reserve, we will not be using it because otherwise it can confuse, it can create confusion. We are still thinking about that, but we still have that in, the, in, our, in our arsenal, actually. It's not really that we will be using those.